So welcome everybody to uh, now a regular VLAT seminar series. Uh, today our speaker is uh, Richard Brown III from Worcester Polytechnic mm -hmm. Institute and he will be talking on the topic of optimal power allocation for cooperative transmission in wireless networks. And uh, let me first introduce the speaker. Uh, Dr. Richard Brown III received uh, the PhD degree in year 2000 from Cornell University in New York and the master degree and the uh, bachelor degree in 1996 and 1992 from the University of Connecticut, uh, all in electrical engineering. He joined Worcester Polytechnic Institute in 2000 as an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He was also employed by the General Electric Company in Connecticut as a development engineer from 1992 to 1997. His research interests include communication systems, networks, and adaptive signal processing. So thank you very much, Professor Brown, for coming. It's your time. Thank you, Leo. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's an honor to be here at WinLab. I've known about WinLab and I've met uh, various people from WinLab uh, since I started my research in 1997 and uh, it's my first opportunity to visit, so I'm really happy to be here today. Um, my talk today is going to be on optimal power allocation uh, for cooperative transmission and wireless networks. Um, I decided when I was putting this talk together to uh, try to avoid doing any ex extensive analysis and just to try to give you more examples of certain cases. Um, I do have, and I'll, some of the talk that I'm going to present to you today is also uh, going to be presented at Silomar this year, which is coming up in about one month's time. So uh, if you are interested in more details, please uh, feel, interrupt me or uh, feel free to see me after the talk if you want more explanations. So um, there's basically three parts to my talk today. Um, after I get done with a brief overview, because I'm never really sure exactly what my audience is going to be, so I want to have a sort of a general overview to get started. I'm going to do uh, part one is basically to look at um, orthogonal uh, protocols, uh, orthogonal amplify and forward protocols, and, and look how um, you can optimally allocate power in those cases. Part two of my talk is to look at coherently combined amplifying forward protocols, which are fundamentally different than the orthogonal case, and I'll talk about how to allocate power in those cases. Um, and then my last, the last part of my talk, which is work in progress right now, is I'm going to discuss carrier synchronization for the coherently combined uh, cooperative transmission protocols. And then I'll conclude uh, very briefly after that. So there's basically three parts to the talk after the overview. Okay. Um, just so everybody knows what I'm talking about, let me give you an example very quickly here of a two-node cooperative uh, transmission. In this example, I've got two sources, and they both want to uh, transmit some information. I represent the information by a colored dot. So the source one would like to transmit uh, some blue information to the destination, and source two would like to transmit some red information to the destination. So this would be conventional multiple access would be, you know, you would divide up the frequency space or you would have some code, uh, code division multiple access. Both sources will transmit their information to the destination and what will happen is the destination will form sort of a hazy picture of what that information is. Okay, so maybe, you know, the, the information is going to be corrupted by some noise and uh, so that, that's basically where the story ends in conventional multiple access. In cooperative communications, we take advantage of something that we get basically for free, and that is that these sources are probably going to be trying to transmit in an undirected sense. So they're going to be transmitting, and they're going to have a single antenna, so their energy is going everywhere, and they can overhear each other's transmissions. Okay? And so if they overhear each other's transmissions, they can also form an impression of what the information was from the other source. And once they have that impression of what the information was from the other source, they can cooperate, for instance, using this protocol uh, developed by Lehman and, and uh, his colleagues, they can cooperate by transmitting information for each other and hence improving the quality of the information at the destination, okay? So this is, when I'm talking about cooperation, this is sort of the, the scenario that I'm thinking of. Um, and this is probably the simplest type of scenario. You have two sources, one destination, and you're trying to find a way that you can exploit the fact that you have undirected uh, wireless uh, transmissions from these sources. How can you uh, cooperate to improve the quality of transmission points. I have a question. Yes. How do you distinguish this from what AirKit, etc. This is, uh, well, AirKit, their first paper, the Sendinaris paper, right? Yes. Sendinaris, uh, Azai, and AirKit, right? 
Their first paper was uh, they looked at a coherently combined case where uh, both sources would transmit simultaneously on the same frequency. And uh, they, towards the end of their second paper, part two of that paper, they discussed the possibility of doing uh, orthogonal cooperation, which is sort of basically what Lehman and those guys are talking about here in 2001. I'm asking you because I've heard you're giving a talk to colleagues. So Tomorrow, yeah. Tomorrow. It's the same talk, so you don't have to come to both. <laughs> I just thought you might want to end, end their means. Uh, okay, sure. Thanks. This, their paper was published in 2003 uh, on that particular example, whereas Lehman had, you know, came Actually, out. that's not true. No? They, they put their first work out in 1996. All right, but... Right. Okay, I don't want to argue the point, but the... Uh, so, so I, I have to give that right. I have to go with that right. Okay. And I don't my advisory, so I have to... <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Uh, okay, so why cooperate? Um, increasing the reliability of communication, sort of like the example we talked about here. Getting spatial diversity without uh, having a real antenna array, right, with just having a virtual antenna array. Right? And then having a you know, reduced outage probability. These are sort of results that have been in the literature since uh, the first paper came out in 1998. Um, increasing achievable rate. This is something that's in the Sundinaris Erica paper as well. Um, and then the question that I, I was always think, I was thinking about since I first heard about cooperation was, how, you know, can we use cooperation to achieve some sort of immediate benefit uh, for these users in the system, for the sources in the system, by achieving a particular SNR target, but can we do it with less overall transmit power, either average or instantaneous? How can, can we use cooperation to do something more physical, less information theoretic? Can we do, use cooperation to do something physical, like save power? And so that was the question that I started thinking of. Um, so it's still as part of the general overview, the two-node cooperative transmission model um, that I'm going to be looking at pretty much for everything today is going to look like this. We're going to have two sources, one destination. We're going to have uh, channels from the sources to the destination represented by the symbol G and intersource channels represented by the symbol H. Okay? Uh, I'm going to make some assumptions so we can get some results. The channels are assumed to be flat, uh, constant over the cooperation transmission interval, uh, known by everyone, although I'll be relaxing that assumption later on, not necessarily reciprocal. And this is an important point. Um, often in, in the cooperation literature, I think channels are assumed to be reciprocal, but if you're on different frequencies, you may not be able to make that assumption. So I'm not assuming necessarily that I've got recip uh, reciprocal channels between the two sources and they're out of the way gaps, knows. So that's my model. And also, by way of introduction, I want to uh, discuss, since I'm interested in power, I want to consider what are the feasible power allocations. And this is inspired by Roy Yates' 1995 JSAC paper, where uh, looked at feasible power allocations for the CDMA kit, for um, channels that have multi-axis interference. What, is, what do feasible power allocations look like in cooperative situations? Not, not interfering situations, but cooperative situations. Okay? So here's the problem. Given a cooperative protocol, and some minimum SNR targets. So we're just talking about the two transmitter case. What power allocations will satisfy these targets? Okay, so the easy case, the trivial case, is let's assume no cooperation. Everybody's operating on orthogonal channels, right? So this is the scenario, no cooperation. In order to achieve the, uh, in order to meet the minimum SNR targets, everything's fixed here. In order to meet the minimum SNR targets, user two has to exceed this particular power value and user one has to exceed this particular power value. And in this entire region, any, any point, any operating point in that entire region is fine. That's a feasible operating point, right? So the question is, that's, that's a pretty simple case. What is it going to look like when we have a cooperative scenario? Now the problem is I have four places to put my power. The two nodes can put some power into the selfish part of their transmission and the cooperative part of their transmission. And what well, the question we're going to ask today is how much should they put into each of those, but what are feasible combinations of cooperative and selfish power? And what's the definition of cooperative versus selfish? Like, is it, are they, is it the, the big streams that they're, that they, the information streams that they're signaling, or? It's back, back to that first sort of uh, animation that I had. Yeah. It's to the, it's the amount of power, for instance, in the first transmission interval, followed by the amount of power spent amplifying and forwarding the the second the other user's information. So the second the amplified forward to the other guy is the cooperative power. Yes, yeah, so I would call that that's what I'm calling the cooperative power. Okay. 
So really, to get the space of feasible things, I need a four-dimensional plot here, right? And that's, um, that's going to be hard to see. So let's see if we can make it come up with an example to get some intuition. All right. The example is going to be this. Let's say users are, are required to put as much power into cooperation as they are into their selfish transmission. Okay, just as an example. This gets rid of two parameters, so we can start seeing things again on a, a two-dimensional space. So if they do this, what sort of space would, what sort of feasible space will we see? This is a possibility for what this feasible space of power allocations might look like, in the sense that as user one, as node one, puts more and more power into the system, that's more and more cooperative power. Node two is required to put less and less power into the system because node one is helping out more and more, right? And the same, the converse, of course, holds. As node two puts more and more power into the system, node one is required to put less and less power into the system. Uh, do you assume that the nodes, they already successfully decoded each other's information? So no. they perfectly know? No, we're, we're dealing strictly with SNR targets here. Strictly with SNR, so right. no beat so far. Just the um, this could be SNR per bit or SNR per code word or SNR per some unit, but it's... Uh, this is but it does assume that each of the parties, they do the detection and probe for decoding or the others. No detection. No, no decoding. Strictly analog. All analog domain, yes. Just a question about this uh, IP, uh, uh, this is the uh, assumption we introduced in the previous part. Uh, 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 I think we assume a subnormal transmission, right? What is the, in the interference here? So yeah, this is a generalization really of, of Roy's idea where in, interference still exists in the system. Interference is strictly from the, it, because we're dealing with orthogonal transmissions, the interference is strictly from the background noise in the system, right? Oh, you mean here it's just noise? Just noise. Oh. So but it, the idea still applies, right? The idea of a feasible, uh, a feasible power allocation still applies uh, to, to the case even where there's no uh, multi-user interference. And that's what we're looking at here. And, but there's some insight that you can get from this picture, I think. It's number one, or the number one question is, where is the optimal operating point on this picture? Should I be, it, you know, when we're looking at the case that uh, both users are orthogonal and not cooperating, it's pretty clear the best place to be is down here in this corner, right? That's the place where both users are transmitting with the minimum power. Here it's not so clear. Should I be here? Well. That's okay, I guess. Or should I be up here? Now user two really benefits, or should I be here? It's not so clear, right? So I don't know what the answer to that question is. Sorry, your threshold, your threshold is all. Yeah? You're asking the same question. I, I think so. Go ahead. The corner yeah, that's what I was going to say. No, it's not. I have examples today to show. You're, you're saying the corner should be inside. Uh, not necessarily. Not rule about using equal power for your own business for cooperation. Right. This may be a bad allocation of powers, and it may actually say that cooperating, in this particular case, that cannot benefit both. Yeah. I think what you're leading to is, can cooperate, can we, can we get the green, on, I have a, I keep clicking this, it will move down there in a second. And the, the answer is no, at that point, this corner does not have to be inside that green line. There can be cases where you don't want to cooperate. You wouldn't, cooperation actually reduces the efficiency of the system. If you require to this picture of cooperation where you spend half your power on your own signal and half on the cooperation signal and, and it, you, if you, right, I mean that's... Totally that's part of it. Maybe it's, it's not the only, it's not the only, it's not the, uh, it's not sufficient and necessary to cause this to, to happen. It's, there are other reasons that would cause this to happen too that hopefully I can, I can show you. Okay. So the, um, is that your question today? Okay. Yeah, that's, I know that that looks strange. Um, so there's lots of questions that I started then to ask, and that is when is cooperation going to be beneficial to one source? That would be these regions, these two slices outside of the, um, uh, of the dash line here where one source benefits. When is cooperation beneficial to both sources? In this example, there is no point in which cooperation benefits both sources. And when does cooperation reduce the total transmit power? That you can't really tell from this picture. The total, you can't really get a feeling for what the total transmit power is. But um, these are questions that I was that I began to ask myself. And so as another possibility, and, and you both both brought this point up, as another possibility, this would be a much nicer uh, re feasibility region because now I've got regions where cooperation benefits one source, benefits another source, and actually a small slice down here where you'd like to be because cooperation both sources get immediate benefit or at least average benefit from cooperating in that region. So this is why we want to cooperate. Otherwise, there may not be as much motivation to do it. Okay, so that's the overview. 
All right, those pictures are not uh, generated from any equations or anything like that. They're just generated from sort of intuitive principles. And uh, now I'm going to get into more of the technical results. This is going to be the orthogonal amplifying forward cooperation. And so let me start out by talking about what the protocol is. As far as I know, this is, and, and someone please correct me if I'm wrong here, this is about the simplest type of cooperation you can do. This is, at least from an implementation perspective, uh, there's, this is the simplest thing you can possibly do for two, for two sources to cooperate in a transmit sense. We're going to have two orthogonal channels, code division, frequency division, doesn't matter, two time slots, and in, um, so I'm these are also orthogonal channels, but I'm distinguishing time from the other two types of orthogonal channels. In the first time slot, I'm doing my selfish transmission. So I have a symbol or a code word and I'm multiplied by an amplitude, and I'm going to send that. And in the second time slot, I'm reserving for forwarding. All I'm going to do in the second time slot is forward the overheard transmission. So I'm going to take what I heard, the received signal that I heard from the other node, I'm going to apply some more amplitude to that, and I'm going to send it along. Okay? That's the protocol. And just to make things perfectly clear, the power allocation, uh, we have the selfish part of the power in the first transmission interval, and the second transmission interval is entirely cooperative power. Okay? So it makes it easy to understand uh, what goes where. The total transmit power, we'll be looking at that. This is the sum of all sources. And then here's the questions that we're going to look at. Are given, given S and R targets for each node, when does cooperation reduce the total required power? And then this is, sounds like a very similar question, but it's actually quite different. When does cooperation reduce the individual transmit power for both nodes? You get a mutual benefit, simultaneous mutual benefit. And they're not the same thing. And I'll have some examples here that will show that's the case. Okay. This is about as uh, difficult as, as the presentation gets in terms of notation. The destination, just to tell you what's going on, before we can answer those questions, I have to tell you what the destination is doing, because the destination is observing a lot of different things. It's going to get four observations. It's going to take those observations and it's going to form decision statistics by linearly combining those observations. And you can prove very easily that the best way to linearly combine those observations is to do maximal ratio combining to get these statistics. So once you, once you prove that, then you can uh, compute the signal-to-noise ratio at the destination as a function of the channel parameters and as a function of the um, amplitudes and the powers going into the system. Okay, and as a function also of the, uh, the noise standard, uh, the noise variance um, in each channel. Okay, so those are, those are the signal-to-noise ratios. Once I have those, I need to define one more thing to allow me to uh, get some nice visualizations here. And this is, I'm going to parameterize, I'm going to par parameterize by these things called cooperation ratios. So this is an important thing because a lot of plots are going to, are going to be over these two parameters. Alpha 1 is the, is the amount of power that user 1, or source 1, puts into the cooperative transmission as a ratio of the amount of power that source 2 put into its selfish transmission. So those of you who have worked in industry uh, know, or actually those of you working in academia may know this too, if you put some money in your 401k plan, you get a company match, right? For every dollar you put in, you get a dollar additional from the company. This is just like the company match. For every watt of power I put in here, I'm going to put the other source agrees to cooperate by producing a certain amount of power, also based on the channel gain. This, the, the other source will cooperate by amplifying and forwarding with that particular cooperation ratio, okay? So the cooperation ratio is the amount of cooperative power by one source over the amount of power actually put into the original transmission by the other source. So I have two cooperation ratios. Does that make sense? This is a sort of a different way of possibly looking at it. So, um, so with that, with all that machinery in place, let's look at a, uh, the simplest possible case. Let's look at non-fading channels. This isn't really a particularly good application of cooperation, but let's just look at non-fading channels. And my, I'm assuming that I've got symmetric source destination channels. So both nodes are, have the same quality channel to the destination. Yes? In the previous slide, mm -hmm. uh, so if, if, if you and me are communicating to a destination, if I increase my power, you have to cooperate with me more? That's right. Even though I might drop you out? Because we're, we're, we're strictly orthogonal. Okay. So we won't be competing for any channel okay. resources. I have another question. What is the gain between uh, uh, S1 and S2? 
So the human nature, these H's. Again, or these H's. These H's. And do you assume that they are equal for, for the next slide uh, when you have G1 is equal to G2? What do you say about H1 and H's? Um, in this particular, most of the examples here, I'm going to assume that they're equal, but it, the, none of the analysis requires them to be equal. You can certainly get these results. The simplest case to look at is one they're equal. And they are like 12 dB stronger than the right. G1s. Right. And this is, I guess, motivated by the fact that you would uh, most cooperation is going to occur by sources that have good inter-user channels, right? You wouldn't you wouldn't cooperate with somebody that you couldn't really talk to, right? So most of the cases I'm going to show here today are going to assume that the inter-user channel is somewhat better than the source destination channel. Okay. Okay. Uh, both nodes have a 10 dB SNR target, and what these plots show, and there'll be quite a few of these, so I think it's worth spending a bit of time. Explaining this, this plot is the cooperation ratio for user for source one. This is cooperation ratio for source two, and then this contour here is the amount of power needed for source one. So let's let's just go over this quickly here. As source two cooperates more and more, as he increases his cooperation ratio for a fixed uh, source one cooperation ratio, the amount of power source one needs decreases. Right? As you cooperate more with me, I don't have to put as much power into the channel. Right? And the same thing is true, this is uh, source 2 power now, as source 1 cooperates, it's symmetric, right? As source 1 cooperates, source 2 needs less power. By the same token, as source 1 cooperates for a fixed amount of cooperation from source 2, he expends more and more power because he has to cooperate more and more, right? So you get these results, and they show, basically the 0 dB line here is, is the uh, break-even line on the, on the plot. So source 1 would like to be anywhere northwest of the zero dB line. Source two would like to be anywhere southeast of that line. And you get a case where there is no place where both sources can mutually benefit. This is sort of an intuitive result because both sources are looking into the same quality of channel. And there's really no point in forward in taking some of the other source's information, which is noisy, amplifying it and forwarding it. That's just going to make things worse. So the best possible place in terms of total power is the place where this is essentially no cooperation. Each user's cooperation, each source's cooperation ratio is minus 30 dB. Okay? And if, you, if sources do agree to cooperate, and if they say, I'm going to match, I'm going to have, a say, a one-to-one -one cooperation ratio, there's going to be a loss in performance. You're going to end up wasting power because it would be better to not cooperate, put all of your power into the initial selfish transmission. Yes? So you mean like cooperation, more cooperation for user two by user one means it's just giving more power to the amplified signal? That's right. Then, um, I don't know, I don't see how uh, it's going to improve because you're going to have to find minus two, right? That's right. Yeah, so this is, uh, I, I tried to hopefully make the point that this should be, this is intuitive. I was surprised when I first saw it, but then I, after thinking about it for 15 minutes, I realized, of course. Because if you're forwarding the other guy's noise, then you can't, it won't get any better, right? There is some special power for from user one you need so that you can get a good output from your from user two. For example, you need at least this much SNR from the user, uh, user one signal so that you can better amplify and forward. Well, no, I'm saying that no matter how good the enter user channel is, this result says no matter how, in, in non fading channels, no matter how good the inter-user channel is, if everything's symmetric, you shouldn't cooperate. That's what it says. Okay? So let's go, let's make this slightly more complicated. Let's look at the asymmetric case. All I've done now is change that uh, source, source one looks to the, looks to the uh, destination at 10 dB, has a 10 dB SNR channel, but source two has a 22 dB SNR channel. So source 2 has all of a sudden got a much better channel than source 1. Okay? And so what you would expect occurs here. Source 2 needs a lot less power overall to communicate to, to achieve the SNR target. And we're, let's just go right to the total power plot, I guess. This is where really all the action is. The best place, on the, in, the best place to operate on the entire system is for source 1 to not cooperate and source 2 to cooperate roughly on a one-to-one -one basis. Not exactly one-to-one, -one. I think the optimal point is 0.9 to one. So the, the alpha two, the optimal cooperation ratio is for source two to cooperate with about 0.9 to one and source one to not cooperate at all. So this would be an asymmetric case. And this, this is the case that, that always bothers me because 
it's a case where it's, how can you make these two nodes cooperate? I know there's been some work done here in, in WinLab about pricing, about getting uh, incentives in the system that force nodes to, or uh, incentivize nodes to cooperate. But this is a particular example where clearly cooperation gives you a huge benefit in terms of total power. It gives you a uh, greater than 5 dB benefit in terms of total power. But it, it's entirely one-sided. One node has to do all the cooperation, and the other node does not cooperate at all. Can just go back one slide? Go back one slide, yes. Since both the games are equal, <coughs> okay, so there was no region where you got this negative value in the total power graph, right? Is that what you're saying? There's no reason where I got negative. I mean, the negative means he has to transfer it. If you if you consider this point sort of the region for the place where there's no cooperation, yeah, the bottom left corner is where both cooperation ratios are very very small, right? So there's really no cooperation going on here. There is no point in this entire plot where there's any gain in total power, right? There is no gain. There is no place that uh, would give you less total power. So the conclusion in this slide is no cooperation. But in this slide, in this slide, the total power improves. Minus five You get a giant gain, like five and a half dB of gain. If the second node, the node that has the good channel, should cooperate, right? The node that has the good channel should be taking. Uh, as much as he can from the node with the bad channel and forwarding it along uh, and helping out that, the node with the bad channel. So that's where, the, that's where all the gain comes in, about almost 6 dB worth of gain by uh, the, the better node, the, the advantage node cooperating in that case. So the user with the better channel is the one who's, who's helping the worst guy out. Okay? Yeah, as you would expect. It's just like a forwarding belt. You just, the user one says to user two and the user two forwards everything Right. Right. But from a uh, from a how do you make this work perspective, especially when you're dealing with systems with autonomous nodes, this is this is this bothers me for some reason. Maybe it's because I'm my political leanings or whatever. But I'd like to have i like to have uh, fairness in the system, right? And this is clearly an unfair case. One node is burdened with having to help the disadvantaged node, and there's really you know how do you how do you make this node help the other node? Um, you know, pricing is one option, but uh, there's other, there's no two has a fair advantage of getting 22 dB as <laughs> Okay. I agree. It's, it is an unfair advantage. Yes. Um, so do you compare the rates that you achieve in this asymmetric case? I'm not trying to make a case for incentivizing or anything, but it's just I would like to understand. And obviously no one which is closer to the destination will only do this for no two if the card you sort of equal the rates or something like that. Right? Sure. See, yeah, I'm not looking at this from an directly from an information theoretic perspective, right? I'm looking at this from a, you know, just a power allocation and achieving signal to noise ratio. So right now both targets have, both uh, nodes have identical SNR targets. So I guess you could sort of extrapolate and say both nodes want the same rate, right? And so what sort of power do they have to put into the system to achieve that rate? That's the other question. But I, I, I'll confess, I, my background is not in information theory, so my background is more on physical error and signal processing side of things, so I didn't want to take a chance and do some information theoretic work and have you guys tell me how wrong it was when I got here. So I stuck to the physical error and stuck to uh, power. Okay. Oh boy, um, this is, I'm not going to get through this whole talk, I'm going to have to skip a few slides. Guys. This is the more interesting case, I think, the really fading channel case. Okay, this is what everybody really wants to do cooperation for. So let's look at the uh, let's look at this case. Uh, if we have fading channels, first let's talk about what happens when we don't have a cooperative communication system. If we have if we have a non-cooperative case, I have I want to compute the amount of power in my transmission. There's no power in the second time slot, so all of my power is in the selfish the selfish part of the transmission. And so it's very easy to figure out that if you have uh, fixed SNR targets, this is what your amplitudes must be. Now the thing is that these G parameters are now random, right? They're really distributed. When the Gs are squared, that of course becomes exponentially distributed. And uh, this came to me as a giant shock, but it of course makes sense again. If you have exponentially distributed random variables on the, on the uh, denominator of a fraction, you take the expectation it's very easy to show that the uh, expected amplitude is an infinite. Okay, so this is not good. This, this is particularly bad. It says if I don't do any cooperation, my average power that I have to put into the channel to meet a fixed SNR target is infinite. Okay. Um, what happens in the cooperative case then? 
Now I have the same thing. I have the amount of power that I put into my selfish transmission, plus I have my mean cooperative power. And I can, without getting into the details, I can show you that the mean cooperative power is finite, as long as my cooperation ratio is finite, and as long as the power from the first source was finite going into the system. Remember, it's let them, it's let them match. So if you put two watts in, I'll put three watts in, right? So as long as everything is finite here, this part, this term is finite. This term is a little bit trickier. You, it, you have to look at this equation here, and there's, there's actually three independent random variables in this equation, three independent exponential random variables in this equation. And it turns out, um, I found a nice trick to this after looking at it for a while, that you can prove that these amplitudes are in fact finite. The amount of power that I would need to put into my selfish transmission is finite as long as the uh, amplitude that the other user is, as long as I'm getting some cooperation from the other node. Let me say that again. <coughs> I can prove that even in a Rayleigh fading situation, the amount of power that I need to put into my selfish transmission is finite as long as I'm getting a little bit of help from the other node. Not an infinite amount of help from the other node, it, it just a little bit of help from the so other node. Your assumption about channel state? Right now, I'm assuming that everything is, is known. Go ahead. And what were your assumptions about the channel state from channel U to channel U? So, so like in the first, in the selfish part versus the secondary, do you get an independent channel? No, it's fixed. Um, in, in the same channel, it's fixed for both transmission slots. And so if I, if I have a... New instance uh, for the next pair of transmission slots. I'll get a new instance for the next pair of transmission or, slots, yes. So you're demanding that you meet the SNR objective in, in every pair of slots. Yeah. So I'm not dealing with a specific outage probability. I'm dealing with a, you must satisfy a fixed SNR requirement at every instance. Yeah. So it's, it's a slightly, yes, well, so could be. So what, hap what happens in Twitter when you say you have cooperation and then I don't need it at all? What happens intuitively? Intuitively, what happens here is it goes back to the non-cooperative case. This goes to infinity, but it goes to infinity, how do you say it? Just barely. <laughs> that's, I guess that's an intuitive concept, right? It's so close to being, that, that integral is so close to being not infinite. Uh, all you would need is a slight uh, variation to the exponent, and it would become non-infinite, right? So what happens here is I get that slight variation. By the other user agreeing to do a little bit of cooperation, I get diversity through two fading channels, and there's enough I get enough benefit from the diversity through the two fading channels that I no longer have an infinite uh, expectation. Okay? I don't know, I can't give you the exact value what, that, what the expectation comes out to. I mean, I'll just have to show you some simulation results. Uh, but the expectation, I can, I can prove that it's bounded. Do you assume that H12 is also a relay? Or yes. Everything is relay. Ever. So, so diversity two really crazy? Is that what you mean? Yeah, sort of diversity three, really. He is I don't know. two is also really. Well, remember, one user is communicating through a uh, series of Rayleigh yeah. channels, right? So you have, I mean, the cooperative part is through two consecutive Rayleigh channels, and then the selfish part is through one Rayleigh channel. So it's three altogether. No, I, was no, I don't agree. It's less than two. It's less than two. Well, well less than two? It's fantastic to be two if the one channel was perfect. Was, if the inter-user channel, if the inter-source channel were perfect, yeah. yeah. So it's less than two. And that was the, so at one it's certainly an infinite case, and at two it's clearly not an infinite case. So the case here is somewhere between one and two. And I wasn't, you know, I'm embarrassed to tell you how long it took me to get this figured out, but it took me a little while to prove that that expectation. So, so you're, you're, if you're going to be worse off um, than if you could do some kind of interleaving, uh, selfish interleaving? So, so you're doing you're temporal, temporal diversity. Yeah, you use each period each double period selfishly and then you you waited and then you did each each essentially fit through two independent channels. Right. Like you should do less this than that. Um yeah, I agree. I agree. You're right, yeah. I'm sorry, I I didn't think of that. That's really interesting. So instead I can I can do my own cooperation. I can cooperate with myself in the next bit in the next bit period. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> 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 that would be well, that would have to be better than whatever this protocol does, right? Because you don't have that inter-user channel to fight through. Right. Okay. Okay. Let's show some some more of these plots. 
This is the fading case now. Now, um, everything. This is a symmetric symmetric case. So both users are looking at statistically identical channels to the to the uh, destination, but independent. They could be different at any given time, right? Statistically similar. Statistically uh, symmetric, but not um, not symmetric on an instantaneous basis. So both users have a 10 dB SNR target, um, symmetric uh, source destination channels, and um, symmetric intersource channels. And what's, what's important here, I underline this, this is a fixed cooperation strategy. So I am, my, my cooperation ratios are fixed, and I'm not altering my cooperation ratio for each instant, instant of the channel. So each time I get new channels, clearly the, the absolute optimum thing to do, if I know everything, would be to compute the optimum cooperation ratio for that set of channel realizations. I'm not doing that here. I am picking fixed cooperation ratios, and I'm looking at how does my performance change as a function of cooperation ratio for over uh, the average of over all the possible channel instances. And so what we get here, this is important, fixed, this is fixed cooperation, so in the sense that uh, these nodes, the destination still has to have full CSI, but these nodes are not really using full channel state information at this point. They're picking a cooperation, they're looking for a cooperation ratio based on mean statistics or uh, possibly higher order statistics, I'm not exactly 100% sure how that works out. But they don't need to know the, the exact instances of the channel to compute these cooperation ratios, to, compute, to get these power uh, curves. So in this case, if it, the mean point, or I don't, unfortunately don't have a line that goes here, but for, for node one, you can imagine that the sort of break-even line comes here between six and eight, right? And that for node two, the break-even line is here between six and eight. And so there's clearly gonna be a large intersection between where both nodes can get advantage on an average power basis. And it turns out on a total power basis, you can go from, uh, well, it's going to be infinite if you keep going down this direction. But from this case here, you can get uh, several dB of gain with respect to the no cooperation case. I mean, the fixed cooperation strategy, I think that's the important point here, is that the nodes have decided on, given the statistics, the nodes will say, well, I'll do an even power match, and you can get uh, a large amount of gain from doing fixed cooperation in this case. Okay. Let's look at the asymmetric case. Um, the asymmetric case is kind of similar. Uh, in this case, node two, again, is the advantage node. Node one is the disadvantage node. And the optimum operating point in terms of uh, minimum total power is uh, node one has a small amount of cooperation to help out node two, but node two does most of the cooperation, has a cooperation ratio of 0.6. Okay. So I've been talking about these uh, regions of mutual benefit, and I, and I wanted to uh, make this more clear. This is, these plots are, the, let's see if I can get the point across here. These are the break-even lines, the zero line and the zero line here. And then these regions are places where both nodes benefit by at least this much, <laughs> okay? So both nodes have some benefit for all cooperation ratios in that football-shaped American football shaped uh, thing right there, right? That American football shaped region. And as you get closer and closer to the optimum point, you see that both nodes will benefit by at least 5 dB if you get to that point right there. And the purple square is the point uh, of uh, maximum fairness. And it's also the hiding behind that purple square is a black star. That's the point of minimum total power. So because everything's symmetric, maximum fairness and minimum total power, and I'm defining fairness in a very uh, loose way. Fairness meaning that both nodes uh, achieve the same benefit. Uh, this would be that they, they, of course, intersect. When I go to the asymmetric case, it turns out that both nodes can get a large amount of gain, but the place of maximum fairness, where both nodes get four, a little bit more than 4 dB of, of gain, is not the same place as the place where minimum total power occurs. I'm sorry, did you define fairness? No, I didn't. I'm defining fairness just in an intuitive sense here. So fairness meaning both nodes get the same gain, get the same uh, benefit in terms of uh, power reduction, total power reduction. Like Sure, it's both in decibels, so yeah, we have to be original. Okay? So what's happening here is it says that um, the maximum place for fairness would be that node uh, one cooperates quite a bit, and node two doesn't cooperate very much at all. 
because Node 1 is putting so much power into the channel anyhow to, to get his, to achieve his SNR targets, Node 2 doesn't need to cooperate that much. But the place where you achieve minimum total power, if you're interested more in the system benefit, you want to say maximize the uh, lifetime of the network or something like that, uh, you may be more interested in the minimum total power metric, and that case is entirely different. Node uh, 2 cooperates more than Node 1. So there's a, uh, I had to go to the thesaurus. There's the, it's incongruous, right? Or incongruous? Which one? Incongruous? Incongruous. Incongruous. Okay. I I talked to like five people about this and I got either way. Either way. Okay. Well there's they're different. How's that? So uh, uh what is the, what is the asymmetry of the thing on the right? It's uh is it, is it yeah. one channel, is some dB better than the other? Yeah, node, uh, this is the case right here. Node 2 it has a uh, 12 dB advantage okay. to, the, to the destination with respect and to And what's the difference when, if you look at the two power points in terms of total power, the, the set fair point versus the minimum total power point? If you look at... Oh, okay. Yeah, let's look at that. A couple dB or so this is uh, roughly, that's a good question. This is about 5 and, say, minus 10. Okay. okay. So we go back to this plot here, and that would put you at uh, around here, here. So it's you're losing about 3 dB in total power, roughly. So again, that's probably I'm revealing too much about my political leanings, but there seems to be there, one of the problems with a comment here? yeah. I've heard this remark twice now, and I'm not sure which way you mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I'll, I'll leave that as a mystery for now. But there should be some fairness in the system, right? I don't know, though. I mean, if one source is, uh, if it's not fair, but one source is closer than the other, uh, what is fairness in the system? In terms, is it in terms of range, or what is fairness? Oh, I don't know what's fairness. Fairness, um, at least the way I'm thinking of fairness, is the amount of gain you receive by cooperating. So why, it, it comes to the incentive of why would you want to cooperate? So you have a cell phone, I have a cell phone, right? Why would your cell phone want to cooperate with my cell phone? It's costing you, bad, it has a cost to you to cooperate, right? It's costing you some battery power for you to cooperate. And it, um, so I guess I'm always concerned about, I know that there are pricing mechanisms, I know there's people here that have thought about this a lot harder than I have, but there, it's, it, you need um, additional infrastructure to induce cooperation if things are not fair, right? And but you always forget about the fact that if you don't cooperate, you have that slot available for some more information. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I That's true. So I'm going to touch you on. Good so I don't, yeah, so I think in some sense that that is sort of accounted for in a comparison, right? So yeah. And then that would sort of, I think. Uh, yeah, so if I'm not cooperating, I'm not using that. Yeah, exactly. Right. You have to have some way of sort of putting that in there to sort of talk about benefits. It's like the it's a good point. Well, what yeah. It's a good point. Even Lanman's work, uh, they talk about uh, uh, they talk about amplifying forward and these are channels. Um, they don't compare with the baseline of if each user use both channels for themselves right. at a certain rate. I mean, that is an information hurdle. You get a certain rate. I mean, is this rate better than this, that? I mean, right. many times you can show it is not. It depends on the geometry and hence you need the channel right. condition. That's a really good point, and I and I think well, yeah, I think that the, that's one of the problems with orthogonal types of cooperation in the sense that you're um, at least the repetition type are orthogonal types of cooperation. I know that um, Nelsortinia and there's a bunch of other people working on coded types. We're not looking at anything here having to do with coding, but there may be some. Uh, this, but I guess the problem with the field right now is that there's a lot of different protocols, and it's not entirely clear uh, which is the best. But uh, your point is, is very good. And I appreciate that. Is that I. None of these cases allow for use of that second time slot. If you're not cooperating, I just let that time go free. Well, so I think that has the same problem. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, he's not doing repetition, though. That's the big difference is he's not doing repetition, right? Well, it's cool. yeah. He's transmitting parity bits and things like that, right? So well, one can always introduce equal rates of both users and the other users. Resolve the issue. You couldn't have this swap uh, free anymore. So I, and when coming up with these results, I started thinking, well, how much gain would I get if I actually optimized my cooperation ratio? Every, if I could. I mean, this might this is an impractical idea, but let's see if, if we could do it. If I if I get all the channel realization, 
I pick the best possible cooperation ratios, I cooperate like that, and then I get new channel realizations, I change all my cooperation ratios, and I dynamically change my cooperation ratio in each fading channel. So, um, and now you've got to figure out, well, what's the best, what's the best thing to do? I decided to pick uh, minimum total power each instant, and uh, rather than looking for fairness or anything like that, just looking at minimum total power. And in this case, you know, when we're dealing with fixed channels, if we're going to optimize over each channel instance, then only one node is ever going to cooperate in each channel instance, right? The other node is not going to cooperate according to the protocol that I've got set up. So there's no instantaneous mutual benefit. Only one node is going to cooperate. So this, the parameters here are all the same uh, as before, except for I'm now varying on this axis. I'm varying the uh, quality of source 2's channel. So over here, source 2 has a very bad channel. Right here, source 2 has an equal channel with source 1. And right here, source 2 is advantage. It has a much better channel than source 1. And I guess the main point from this plot, this is um, red is total, blue is uh, source 1, and green is source 2. The main point from this plot is the dashed lines are the fixed cooperation ratios, and the solid lines are the dynamic cooperation ratios. And at least in this one example that I ran, there's only about 1 dB of difference between them. And I guess I felt, I felt good about this result because it said that even if I knew everything and I optimized on it, uh, symbol by symbol basis, I would only get about a dB a gain versus picking a fixed cooperative strategy based on the average values of the channel, the statistics of the channel, and just going sticking with that, I only get about a 1 dB overall gain. So compared to, say, the gains that you see on these plots back here, Does it depend on the fading, like the variance of the why is it because of taking lot of Well, there's only, one, there's only one thing you can do with really fading channels, right? When you pick the mean, you, you also set the variance, right? So uh, we haven't done a full investigation on this and yet into, as to how sensitive it is to the various parameters, but this is a case that we picked. And I guess it, uh, there, you can still take this case and, and say, well, there's one dB gain here, and then look back to, say, uh, the symmetric case, where you're seeing gains of you know, 4 and 5 dB from doing no cooperation or very little cooperation. So as a percentage of the uh, amount of gain you can get by cooperating, uh, doing so full board dynamic cooperation. What you define as a solid line is yep. at each instance you get a, uh, a pair, you get a full set of channels, yep. the channel states are, and you choose the, the power vector that is the sum of components minimum that delivers the, the requisite SNR That's for right. that set of channels to the destination. That's right. This is sort of a uh, uh, test of what's possible. I mean, well, what is possible if you knew everything at every instant? Right. You couldn't, um, you couldn't do any better than that in terms of minimum total power uh, well, without changing the protocol, of course. Uh, if you knew everything all the time, this is the best you could do given that protocol, would be the solid line. But if you pick a fixed cooperative strategy that says, I will cooperate with this ratio based off of some, say, knowledge of the statistics of the channel, some mean values of the channel, for instance, then you would only get, you'd only lose about one dB, as long as you pick that cooperative point correctly. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is one case, I'm not saying this is true everywhere, but at least in this case that we looked at, it was about 1 dB. Okay. And we don't have any analysis to support this, so... so, so the intuition? The intuition? Diversity? Again? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. This is about, this result's about two weeks old, and I'm not sure I really have a solid uh, feeling for why it's only 1 dB. Um, I don't know yet. Yeah. I think I, one of the reasons is, well, I'll give you a little bit of intuition, I guess. One of the reasons is, at least in this case, there's really not a lot of, this, the steepness of the slope is, is not that steep, right? Um, if I cooperate at zero, or if I cooperate at minus five, you know, I'm not losing that much uh, by having dramatically different cooperation ratios. So the, intu the only intuition I could uh, offer at this point, I guess, is that uh, because it's not that steep, it's not that sensitive to uh, my cooperation ratio, um, I, all I have to do is get about, I have to be right on average, but I don't have to be right all the time. That would be, that would be the best guess at this point, I guess. 
you know, if you have more cooperating users, not two, but three or four, so would these curves become even closer to each other, the dashed and the solid ones? I, uh, I started doing some analysis on the three node case, the three source case, and it got, got pretty ugly. And so uh, uh, it became very difficult because then, you know, you start thinking about protocols that now have three time slots. Okay. And then the one source then observes two transmissions of that same piece of information. So he's got to do his own local combining first uh, before he does amplifying forward. And uh, there were a lot, it seemed like there were a lot more parameters. To the place you're getting more diversity is we sort of averages out the fact that the dash line doesn't have these continuous values. So it can actually, if you've done right, you can bring solid and dash line closer to each other. I don't know, I don't know. Yes. I don't know if I can say that. Um, I, I, I can't disagree with you, but I don't know if I necessarily agree either. I think the dynamic cooperation with the battery, the channel changes faster than it does now? Well, the channel changes every every symbol interval, so it's... Uh, I know. You, you are demanding that the channel change only after two times. Sure. Oh, so dynamic, dynamic cooperation would be better if the channel changes each you need, to, you need to know two more channel parameters than I guess to do that, one, right? So, um, I don't know. This is uh, this is one example, and I just I thought it was nice because uh, it showed that even fixed cooperation can give you some benefit. So I mean, you get most of your benefit from just doing fixed cooperation, at least in the protocol that I'm considering here. I'll skip that slide because uh, I think I'm I'm no. almost out of time already, right? Yeah, but you get both enforcing very hard time limits, so I think. You're okay. Um, that was the majority of the talk. That's the part of the talk that I'm going to have at um, at Silomar this this uh, fall. And now I, I have to take into account this uh, extra consideration you gave me about perhaps using that second part of the channel for yourself. I'll, I'll give that some, some thought before that presentation. Um, coherently combined amplified and forward cooperation. I just want to. Um, I have some very brief slides on this. This is some very recent work that we've been doing uh, in my group at WPI. The basic motivation for this. Um, is now you're going to, we want to have a protocol where, unlike the orthogonal case, we want to have a protocol where both sources are transmitting in the same channel and their bandpass signals are arriving with identical phase at the destination. So this is like an antenna, right? right? You want to have uh, the, the, even if the sources are far apart, you want to have them transmitting in a way that their bandpass signals arrive with identical carrier phase. And so you get a nice, you can have a lot of gain in this type of system. Um, you can have a, re a big reduction in the required transmit power because the amplitudes add before they square rather than squaring before they add, right? So even in a two-node case, there's a potential for a lot of gain in the system, okay? So the idea is um, <coughs> this is similar to uh, the Sundanaris ERKIP uh, protocol, also uh, Lehman space-time coding protocols. Um, the, the idea is basically uh, I now have to look at this in terms of two sources, two different channels, with actually four different physical channels, okay? So the idea is basically this, uh, similar to the orthogonal case. In time slot one, I, each node sends on their own channel. In time slot two, source one is going to do two transmissions. He's going to transmit again. He's going to repeat himself on his own channel again. And source two is going to jump on that channel with source one and simultaneously amplify and forward and combine combine with uh, source one. So they add coherently. Okay, and the same thing. Source two uh, is going to repeat himself in that channel and source one is going to um, amplify and forward what it heard in the first interval and so that they coherently combine at the receiver. Okay, so the amount of channel resources is the same as the uh, orthogonal case um, the, the time, first time slot is the same as the orthogonal case. Time slot two is different in the sense that the source, the destination now observes some signals because we're assuming right now that we can do this coherent combine. Okay? And the only, the real cost of this is that you're, it's going to be hard to do this probably, right? You're going to have to, uh, well, you have to find a way to synchronize your sources so that you can get coherent combining. And that's, that'll be the last point of my talk today. one more cost, which is that now your sources are transmitting no power and add. Uh, well, I'm, I'll argue against that, actually. So, uh, they won't be transmitting more power on average because of the gain that you're going to get from the coherent combining. Yeah? 
Okay. We'll see. I mean, if, if they do add coherently, um, you can you could get a 3DB game, for instance. If, you, if everything were uh, ideal, you could have a 3DB game from uh, adding coherently rather than transmitting orthogonally. Does that make sense? Right, but relative to the orthogonal case where you weren't transmitting in that other slot, I would, I would, uh, all I would just argue in general that it, uh, if you could coherently combine, you've, you've got to do better than orthogonal, right? I'm not, I'm not arguing about the case where you use your second channel resource for yourself, right? But the, uh, just in general, the power is going to, the power gains are better when you're, when you have coherent combining, right? Which is just general intuition, okay? All right, um, we get the same kind of decision statistics with maximal ratio combining. There's a new piece in these decision statistics due to the uh, sum of the two signals in the second transmit interval, um, if you want details on that later. And now I have the problem with doing this analysis is now instead of uh, four parameters, I have six parameters. So I decided to, um, I decided to make up some new parameters, these beta parameters. And these beta parameters are the selfish repetition ratio. So I'm, remember, I'm transmitting my, my own information in the first interval, and I'm also transmitting my own information again in the second interval. And this beta has to do with how much, how I allocate my power, my selfish power between the first and second intervals. Intuitively, intuitively, I would, I don't want to put all my power in the first interval because I won't get any coherent combining gain in the second interval, right? And I don't want to put all my power in the second interval because no one will hear me in the first interval. So there has to be some optimum point there, right? Okay. So here's the approach. It's a little bit, uh, because there's so many parameters, we have to sort of condition on things, right? So I'm still conditioning on my I pick a fixed cooperation ratio, and now I'm going to pick fixed selfish repetition ratios, and I'm going to compute the minimum uh, required transit power for each source. And you have to solve it's like a fourth order polynomial, but you can get it. And uh, you get, this is one example, and then I have, a, I have another example after this. This is the this is back to the symmetric case with fixed channels. So remember, we didn't get any gain in the symmetric case with fixed channels uh, when we didn't when we did the orthogonal uh, cooperation, right? So this would be like orthogonal cooperation. When I go to coherent combining, if I uh, if I pick betas as uh, both betas at 1.5, I actually get I can get it down to 1 dB, which is about a little over 2 dB gain in the overall system. So if I put Roughly 1.5 times as much amplitude into the second interval as I do into the first interval, I get about uh, I get a couple dB of gain, about a 2 dB improvement in minimum total power. Okay. Um, there's a big region of mutual benefit, just like the other slide. I'll skip that. And I have a movie here actually. Uh, I was playing around with this a little bit. Um, these are the plots now: of user one's power, user two's power, and the sum power in the overall system. And the movie is going to play starting with beta equals zero all the way up to beta equals 4. Okay? And watch this one. This is the one that's probably most interesting in the beginning. So as, as beta increases, the you get this, the total power develops this blue lake, and then it actually comes back up again at the end. So that's the, that's the point I was trying to make before. Let's see if I can, I'll say that for you one more time. Watch the one in the top right corner. Wait, wait, so just before you have the blue lake, what? What does the blue lake mean? Like this is less power. The more blue it is, the less power. Cold. Total power you have in the system. Cold. Right, these are the same contour plots, except uh, rather than having contour lines moving around on the screen, I'm, I switched the colors now. But the, the idea is this is the total power plot. And as, the, as it gets bluer and bluer, it gets low, less, less t required power. Right? So did you see what happened there? The lake got deeper and then the lake came back up. And that says that if you actually, this is the total power plot right here. As you plot this, uh, the black line, the minimum point occurred right around beta equals 1.5, where the lake was at the deepest possible point. Yeah. It didn't go much. Huh? It didn't go up much. No, it doesn't come up much. So, uh, yeah, it's it's very subtle. So you. Somehow that's for a fixed alpha, right? Some fixed uh, cooperation. That's, that's for uh, the best alpha combination on the, on the plot here. Would it fair to say? that if you move to the non-symmetrical case with different gains, 
may have the advantage of cohesion combining, orthogonal combining to the middle? Yes, I agree 100%. What, what are the Oh, if he considers here the symmetric case, all the gains yeah. are the same. Now, if he moves to a non symmetric case, some gains better more than others, then actual advantage of coherent combining will diminish. Yeah. All right, the biggest advantage is uh, when they're symmetric. Yeah. Or the triangle inequality, I guess, yeah. All right, I don't want to, because I'm already over time, I'm not going to explain all this. Because for the, for the orthogonal uh, cooperation, actually the biggest gain you get when you're non-symmetric. When you're That's completely right. symmetric and orthogonal, there's no gain. That's right. And so coherent, yeah, yeah, very good point. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just want to understand. So what's this curve um, down uh, in the second? Uh, okay. I was going to skip that, but if, uh, if you want to know, the blue line is the total power required by user 2, for instance. Uh, the blue line is the amount of power in the first selfish transmission. The red line is the amount of power in the second selfish transmission. And the cyan line, C is for cooperation. So that's the amount of power uh, in the cooperative part. And this is, um, I ran out of room on this plot to put legends and things like that. So there's a million things going on. But the, the idea, um, the idea here is that actually as data keeps increasing, the amount of cooperative power uh, actually goes down because you're putting more and more power into that second uh, transmission anyhow. So there's going to be, uh, for some reason, the optimal point turns out to be need less and less uh, cooperative power in the second transmission. Okay. Because everything's symmetric, all those plots look exactly the same. Sorry, was that a question? No, I was just curious. Like The next thing is that you're going to show us how to synchronize. Yeah. Is that what you're here for? Yeah. Okay. Why don't I uh, get right to that then? Carrier synchronization. Since I'm already over time. Don't um, worry. So I, uh, I've been looking at this problem for a little while. But I, when I was at ISIT this year, I noticed I heard at least three different people say, the, we require carrier synchronization, but we, we don't really know how we're going to do it, basically. They paraphrase that. And uh, so I, th I started thinking, well, this is important, especially because of the gains that are possible in the coherent combining case. So I, the only things I could find in the literature, and I'd be happy if anyone knows of anything other than this, um, please let me know, because the only, I, I've done quite a while with this. I found this uh, paper by Upmanu, 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 Madhoff. I've met him a couple times, I can't get his first name right. Um, it talks about how to do this by basically uh, he wants to place all of his nodes exactly the same distance from the sort, from the destination, and then have a synchronization beacon sent out, and then they all come back with the same round trip phase delay because they all see the beacon at the same phase because they're all the same exact distance. That could be really hard to do. Um, if you're talking about a 2.4 gigahertz carrier, for instance, your wavelength is on the order of a meter, and so if you're off by 10 centimeters, I mean, this whole thing goes goes pretty badly. So um, that, that, this is one approach, but I think it could be hard to do. And it also requires everybody to stay in fixed positions, right? The other idea that I found was um, Greg Potty that, uh, from 2002. He, the idea basically is to send a synchronization beacon. It's, it's pretty, pretty brute force, basically. Sources respond. He computes the total round trip uh, phase delay, transmits a phase correction to each of the sources, and uh, the sources all locally correct the oscillators. And, it all works. So there's a lot of um, a lot of hands. You're going to spend a lot of handshaking to make this sort of thing work. And again, if you've got mobility in the system, you might have to do this very frequently to make it happen. So uh, what about yeah. GPS? GPS. Why don't you set an external clock that they all clock? Well, what are your what are your timing requirements here? If you want to have, a, if you're talking about say a 2.4 gigahertz system, and you want to have everybody uh, synchronized to within. Uh, you know, a tenth of a wavelength. Uh, His wavelength is 10 centimeters. No, my wavelength is about a meter. No, it's it's four, four, eight, six, 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 12. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 12, 12, 12 centimeters. 12, 15, yeah. 15 is 2 yeah. Right. Forgot a decimal point there. Um, See, one centimeter. So, one centimeter. Um, so, you're certainly like in the, definitely in the nanosecond. What sort of timing but isn't that really the GPS doesn't really help you because because it, the the real thing is the problem the radio path. Right. Yeah, and that's uh, that's, that's a really good point. Yeah. The real thing is, I I if if we're cooperating, we want to arrive with 
in phase to you, right? If you want to do this coherent combining cooperation. So in phase to you is not the same thing as in phase to him. How, how, how you can you speak of this when you get scattering in Mars? When you get what? When you get scattering in Mars, which most of them are. Right. There is no free space. You can speak of that. Uh, Round trip is in free space. In, in this room, there is no way that you can go in further stages based on the uh, uh, round trip. Uh, I guess we're at least assuming our strongest path, right? So there's. Um, he, he can think of some sort of a ZM system with a cyclic prefix which sort of accounts for it lands all this multi pass into one larger symbol. I think you can you can hide this problem under the carpet. Mm -hmm. think, uh, well, that's what the is doing. There's no carrier in ultra If you're modeling channels as Rayleigh, you're assuming that there is a lot of scantling. Right. Yes. And then on the other hand, you're assuming there is a, a free space, uh, right. so it's like opposite. Right. Um, that's why I try to divide the talk up into three different parts. So this part of the talk is not uh, is not related to the first two parts in the sense that I don't, I'm not going to give you more uh, contour plots or anything like that, right? This is just talking about how to do character synchronization. Um, in a scattering environment, I agree it's more... But, excuse me, but Dragon, should he just synchronize himself to be in the cycle of traffic so that's done? No, we're talking carrier synchronization. This is important. It's the currently planned stuff at the receiver. So on the, you on, know on exactly the phase shifts that the channel introduces. Yeah, that would be. And that these phase shifts are not just due to a free space uh, propagation. Yeah, then multipass becomes a big issue. As well as air temperature and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's it's the temperature of the oscillator? Uh, I had mine more index shifts just from barrage effects. Temperature of the air changes even. Okay. Well, I'll show you something that can work with Doppler shift. I'm not going to guarantee that it will work in multipath, but I'll, uh, the, the major impairment that we've considered so far is Doppler shift, and I have examples that uh, I hopefully will convince you that it could work in Doppler shift. Let me give you the basic idea, though. Um, this is this is the um, I have an undergrad actually at WPI helping me out with this. Um, he's doing most of the simulations, and uh, the basic idea is this. You, no matter what, you've got to have something come from the destination for this to work because you need to know where the destination is. So everything starts with the destination. The destination is going to send out a, just a carrier, goes omega zero T, right? The sources receive that carrier, single path channels, no multi path right now, and the sources receive that carrier, but they're going to receive it with a time delay, tau O1 and tau O2, right? Just free space propagation, simple love. The sources now use what's called a uh, frequency synthesis PLL, internal, to generate a new uh, frequency, omega-1, and there's going to be some phase delay occur incurred in that PLL, right? So there's, you can't get through the PLL without some kind of phase delay. So the phase delay is represented as delta. Is it the same for both? It is the same for both, yes. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. It's all dependent on what sort of phase detector you take. So if I pick a phase detector that has 90 degree uh, stability point, then it would be the same on both. Okay. When that, that they transmit those signals, and when it's received at the by the other source, now the source has to listen to both of these. It's received by the other source. There's another phase, there's another time shift here, tau one two, because of the propagation between the two sources, right? I think you can see where this is headed. The sources take those signals and synthesize a third frequency. And these are all just these are unmodulated. Oh, well, this last one would be modulated, I guess. But all the other signals right now are unmodulated. The third frequency with another delay. So the delay might not be exactly the same because it's, it's a, if it's a 90 degree phase shift on one frequency, it's, that's a different delay than a 90 degree phase shift on another frequency. But it is going to be the same across both sources. And what happens when they arrive at the destination? The basic idea is when they arrive at the destination, they now arrive with exactly the same phase shift. What if you have more than a two pi phase shift? Not a problem. I, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. You don't care when the signal's modulated? Don't you need to shift it by that amount? So because the, well, the ratio, the basic assumption, the reason why I'm saying it doesn't matter, I don't mean to be flip about that, but the reason why I'm saying it doesn't matter is because the carrier to bit, the number of carrier cycles per bit interval is going to be enormous, right? I'm going to have at least a thousand carrier cycles per bit interval. So what if, I, if I'm off by 10 carrier cycles, I'm still going to get 99.9% .9 of uh, bit overlap. If 
I'm running a gigahertz <coughs> data over this that's a foot between the symbols. That's okay. So you will be many, many two pi multiples off if you're a thousand feet away. Does that matter? I don't. Um, actually, I don't think it matters because, because coherently. You ultimately, we don't you want the the modulated signals to add up coherently. Yes. So you do care about those n two pi n. Uh, right. Phase shift. Except you want to do it at the carrier level. So you almost need to chirp this carrier or something so you have some way of knowing what your, your absolute phase is. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, so long as it's, it's T instead of phi, it's okay. That's the way we're looking at it in terms of T's. And, um, but the, the thing is, I guess how do you achieve blood synchronization? Your question is how do you achieve blood synchronization? And yeah. We always thought that the bot synchronization problem would be easier than the carrier synchronization problem, so we started on the carrier synchronization problem first. And you'll get it right within factor of two pi n. With sure. And then you need to somehow. And then we need another method for achieving some sort of bot synchronization. Be a higher layer off. As, if your if your data rate is a, is a gigabit, yeah, we're going to need to do something like that. Megabit. And that's a thousand gigabit. That's still you're going to be okay. Depending yeah, depending on the application. If you're a kilometer away, you're a couple of two pi n. Okay. So I think if it starts still looking like something that's worth worrying about. Probably. Okay. Um, this is sort of a static view of the same thing I just showed you. Uh, the whole idea is that everything starts at the destination. You've got a master frequency beacon, um, goes through a delay, goes through some frequency synthesis PLLs, ends up being received by the other node, and you have that round trip behavior in the overall system. And the reason it works is because the delays around one part of the path are the same as the delays around the other part of the path. Okay? Does that generalize the gray No. That, that, that's a big problem. That's a very big problem. I don't know how to make this work for three. At least not without some sort of really kludgy sort of protocol where this guy does something first and the other guy does something second. And the nice thing about this is it sort of works, uh, well, at least in single path channels, I should say. It, it works. Uh, without any real configuration of the nodes, right? The nodes are actually identical, right? They have the same frequency synthesis PLLs. They, they do everything the same as each other. So you could just throw two nodes in a, you know, on the floor, basically, and not really need to know who is who, and you could still achieve this sort of um, coherent combine. Right? And if you go to a three-node case, I don't see an, an elegant extension of you know, this idea. So your assumption in Delta is that all nodes are basically equal. If you sort of make resistors slightly off, then those deltas are not going to be that far apart. I, if in a phase lock loop, um, if you have an, if the way that you know how a phase lock loop works, right? How it, you, it's all based on the phase detector in terms of where the um, resulting phase shift is through the phase lock loop. So if I think of say a standard uh, four quadrant multiplier from a phase from a phase detector that has 90 degrees and minus 90 degrees are the standard operating points where it's going to be. Uh, Stable, so that's going to be the same. It's still going to be 90 degrees, whether I, you know one's operating at 100 degrees and the other one's operating at 50 degrees. They're still going to go to 90 degrees. That's still the, that's that's how they operate. So it, it's a uh, it's got a feedback loop, right? It's not um, that's not, that's the whole point, I guess. Is it's got a feedback loop, and that's what gives you the that's why I can assume that those deltas are going to be you know the same within a tenth of a degree. Okay. So here's an example uh, that my undergraduate was able to generate. Um, I picked some random propagation delays, random initial phases, random quiescent frequency. So I, I picked some pretty bad oscillators here. You can go, uh, you can buy dollar oscillators that do better than this. This is plus or minus 500 parts per million from nominal. And uh, I picked some, just some very uh, simple frequencies to just see what we would get. So the beacon frequency is 30 megahertz. The inner source. Uh, we get a doubling between the inner sources, and then we get 120 megahertz again, another doubling. And so this is the this is the received unmodulated carrier at the destination. So there's nothing about bit timing. There's nothing about symbol timing in this picture, right? right. And you can see within about 750 beacon cycles, uh, we're at lock. The, this is the axis here is uh, two to minus two to two. So this would be two uh, unit amplitude sinusoids in phase adding together. Okay. Single path channels, right? Um, 
I asked my students to run a big set of Monte Carlo simulations over this past weekend to see what was the effect of PPM on the uh, oscillator accuracy in terms of PPM on the uh, mean power of the output. And even with really bad oscillators, you still uh, you, you lose a little bit of power with, with uh, particularly bad oscillators, but you don't the amount of power you lose is less than one percent. The standard deviation uh, goes up a little bit. So this this took a long time to run. He was only able to get 60 iterations on this, but the, the I guess the point here was, is this going to work with cheap oscillators? And the answer is, at least in the end of the model that we looked at, yes, it will work with cheap oscillators. Would a Lorian type solution work for this, where you send out a, a CW and then an, an offset uh, frequency that uh, is different from it by a relatively small amount, so then you end up with beeps that are well defined and much larger than the distance between you? So each one could just each receiver. And Ray Lord was talking about yeah. how you generalize to N. So each of the N receives the Lorian signal and knows exactly how far it is in radio space from the transmitter and can just send that phase shift to the other the other one. It's like a vernier, right? You've got right, right. One that's a little they're off just they're off by a little bit, so you get, a, little bit. you get a very low frequency right. beat, right? And that low frequency beat is longer than your maximum distance and then each one can just send its own information around Robin to the group. That's clever. Yeah. I think that generalizes <laughs> <laughs> that generalizes uh, to end if you for, for getting simple time. Right. Yeah. I think you can do that for carrier time. Because you got the beats with the carrier. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe so you can have some absolute distance in, in, I mean, the whole point behind line is you can have absolute distance in radio space right, without any other information. Right. From a single transmitter. Sure. From a single transmitter. Right. So you can okay. plot on multiple ones. Right. right. So you can get a You don't need the regulation. Okay. You just need the absolute distance. Yeah, that's really interesting. Can, let's talk, can we talk about that after? Sure, I just yeah. love everything I know about. <laughs> okay. But I'm happy to talk to you. The funny thing is, I'm a sailor. It can be used in navigation. I mean, it's not yeah. GPS killed all these old... Yeah. Uh, right. I should know about this, but I started sailing after uh, right. Loran was replaced by GPS, right. so I, unfortunately I'm not familiar with that. So, um, I, Two slides left. Um, I'm going to wrap up. I'm sorry this, I went so far over. Uh, I wanted to, I was really worried, is this going to work in a, in a case with mobility? And so I sat down and did some analysis on this. And it turns out the equations, you don't get a nice solution um, when you have mobility in the system because of the Doppler shifts in the system. So I said, well, if it's going to work in position A and it's going to work in position B, it ought to work, you know, if I move slow enough from position A to position B, it ought to work at every point in between, right? So I uh, had the, my student help me out and uh, do some more simulations. We, our simulation is this. This is, a, this is a pretty extreme simulation, but we needed to do it within the amount of uh, simulation time we could run. This, the whole system begins at a fixed position up until uh, 50 microseconds, which is right here. And then at 50 microseconds, source 2 immediately accelerates into a constant velocity motion and he's moving at 8,000 meters per second. And there's a, there will be a bonus point. Who knows why I picked 8,000 meters per second? It's a rough number. You'll climb on the rockets? It's, uh, uh, it's about the speed of space shuttle travel yeah. uh, in orbit around the Earth. So, you know, I picked that as, a, as an... I don't know. I picked that as a number that we can get into the simulation here. And you can see this amplitude modulation that you get on the carrier. So there is going to be a little bit of uh, loss of power, but if you can't see my scale here. My scale is 1.9 to 2, so that modulation is all above 1.99, basically. So there's very, that, we didn't see it at first, and I said, zoom into that stuff on the top there. And sure enough, there was something up there at the top. So I said, well, what if we go even faster? What if we have to, you know, communicate with Mars or something like that? So we went up to 30,000 meters per second, <laughs> and uh, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have relativistic effects here pretty soon. But you're gonna, you get a faster uh, amplitude modulation. But the important thing is, the the index, the modulation index, doesn't seem to be increasing as the velocity is increasing. I, I, I can't bound it or anything like that yet. But this is very, this is like yesterday results, where uh, we were running some simulations just to get a feeling for how how much the uh, uh, velocity is going to affect how this works. Because analytically, it, it doesn't appear like it's going to work. The equations don't come out nice when you have velocity in the system. But it still seems to get most of the, uh, the game. Uh, 